Welcome to the third session of the Remarkable Women, Powerful Stories, a leadership series by Zontra International. Today, once again, we have a broad global audience with participants from so many different time zones. I thank you most sincerely for choosing to spend the next 45 minutes with me and our very special guest at our third conversation. I'm Lynn Foley, Chairman of the Zontra International Leadership Development Committee, and it is an honour and a privilege to host this leadership series. I wish to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet today and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging, and also pay that respect to any First Nations people present today. Zontra International is a leading global organisation of professionals empowering women worldwide through service and advocacy. In 1919, a small group of founders in Buffalo, New York, had a vision to help all women raise greater equality, realise greater equality. Today, more than 25,000 members in 63 countries work together to make gender equality a worldwide reality for women and girls. Since 1923, Zondra International has provided more than 41.2 million US dollars to empower women and girls and expand their access to education, healthcare, economic opportunities and safe living conditions. My guest today is Tressa Lacey. Tressa is co-founder of Undaunted Women, a nonprofit that advocates with low-income women to identify and overcome their barriers to self-reliance. She's an adjunct professor accounting in accounting at Brigh Brigham Young University, Idaho, and founder of Tressa Accounting and Business Solutions, her business consulting company. Tressa is the mother of five children, ages four to 14, two of whom are adopted and are experiencing special needs. Tressa's early path was not an easy one. At the age of five, she began stacking boards in the family's logging business. Just four years later, she was wielding a chainsaw. At 14, after enduring attempted rapes and leg shattering logging in injuries, Tressa chose a more positive path forward through education and community engagement. With a master's degree in accounting from the University of Washington, Tacoma, Tressa now encourages other women to rise to their potential, generating financial infrastructure in impoverished communities. Tressa is the recipient of many honors, including Zonta International's Jane M. Klausman Women in Business Scholarship, Puget Sound Business Journal Little Enterprises Women of Influence Scholarship, American Association of University Women Career Development Grant, and an Education Foundation for Women in Accounting Award. Currently, Tressa is completing a memoir about her experiences as a child lumberjack. She also find time, finds time to volunteer as a board member with the Pacific Northwest Regional Council of the Institute of Management Accountants. Well, welcome to you, Tressa. It's such an honour to have you with us today with our audience from all parts of the world. Your career and professional achievements are truly astonishing and inspiring, and you have a unique and powerful story. I know that our audience today are most interested in knowing more about you, your achievements and your aspirations for this future. So to begin, I'd like to ask you to share your story from your childhood and how you've been able to access those education opportunities to bring you to where you are today. Lynn, thank you so much for the invitation to speak with you today. I'm very excited. As mentioned in my intro, my journey starts as a five-year-old working at a sawmill, 12 hours a day. Abandoned by his employees, my father continued his logging operation by putting my siblings, my 13 siblings and I to work. My journey really is one of how do I learn? And as things became more, we got into more poverty, as things became worse, how do I get out of poverty? And my journey really continues this way for 10 years with one particular moment standing out. All 14 of us were living in a small school bus on the top of the mountain, still trying to carve it all around the mountains. When I was 14, I remember one particular experience of when my leg was shattered. It was a hot July day and I found myself lying on the forest floor all alone. I didn't know what had happened or what to do. All I knew was that if I didn't get up and find somebody to help me, I would die all alone on the forest floor. So my journey and this moment really stands out to me because this is the way I've been able to access education and opportunities in my life. 
I've had to tenaciously jump up and just like I did at that moment, jump up and I ran on a shattered leg to find somebody who could help. I've had to do that because getting an education from where I was from and, and the conditions I was given, it wouldn't have been possible alone. So I needed a lot of help. I needed mentors. I knew that education was the, treat, the key to opportunity and that I wasn't gonna find it where I was. So for me, really being able to find these wonderful people, these scholarships, these organizations, and these mentors and friends who lifted, encouraged me and supported me every step of the way, I've been able to attend college. I've been able to graduate with my master's degree in accounting, and I'm here speaking with you now. Wow, so it's uh, an incredibly um, difficult, I guess, and challenging beginning. And when you and I first talked, and you told me a little bit more of the story, it's, it, it was that difficult and challenging. And, and like so many um, men and women have a really difficult start in life, don't they? Uh, where life, life brings them all sorts of challenges and, and yours, again, is as challenging as any I've ever heard. So it's interesting in your fan, when I was reading your bio and in our early discussions, we talked a lot about your family and your life and what it's like. One of the things that the women I work with, and I certainly know the, the people listening today and watching us, they're always interested to know how you manage it. And I think it's a question that's always asked of women. It's a shame that we have to ask it of women because I think we should ask it of men as well. But it's that piece about life must be a juggling act. It is for every, every person. In your case, it seems like it's a big one. So can you talk to us about how you manage that juggle, juggle between your study, your career, your children and your whole family and your husband. And <laughs> how, do you, how do you make that happen on a daily basis? And, uh, and so my life is a, a zoo. My home is a zoo. So <laughs> first of all, though, I would like to thank feminism for creating these kind of opportunities because I can have a study, I can have a career, I can have children. So we're making progress. <laughs> but yes, honestly, my home is a zoo. I have a four-year-old who's loud and demanding in an attempt to be heard over his four older siblings. And then I have two kindergartners, which has made homeschooling this last year to the pandemic very, very entertaining. So if you take a sneak peek into my house, as my companion and I are trying to get four children into Zoom meetings at the same time, not to mention juggling our own Zoom meetings, it is, it's, just, it's just a comedy. I have a six-year-old son that has a really, really short attention span and has experienced some attention issues. So eliminating distractions for him is key, but then his twin is experiencing autism and a seizure disorder. So she frequently has meltdowns at the mere sight of a screen. So, I mean, under the desk, screaming, kicking the wall, kind of autistic meltdowns. So it's hard to get them both their needs met at the same time. Fortunately, my older two daughters are really more self-sufficient. They still need help. And then I'm juggling my accounting clients, teaching accounting students, and serving women, many who need assistance urgently and are in much, much harder circumstances than I am. So it's just really hard, and I don't always juggle very well, but I do manage a lot better when I ask for help and when I'm compassionate with myself when things don't go as smoothly as planned. I'm just mm. taking a moment to say, this is a moment of suffering, and we're all in this together, and just remembering that I'm not alone. It really helps me. I heard that theme um, when we first met each other and I'm hearing it already in the conversation today. It's that, that piece about asking for help, A, knowing when to, and B, having the courage to ask. Do you find in the beginning, did you find in the beginning and even now that it does take some amount of courage to ask for help? I believe that asking for help is a very, very vulnerable thing to do. And in my particular family, in my upbringing, I grew up with a family motto was, you know, image of it all, never ask for help. Really just, we can do it. And I mean, even with my shattered leg, it was a challenge to, I experienced this, this moment where I was brought home from the hospital. My leg was six inches wide and getting wider because I had developed compartment syndrome in my leg and it was just swelling, swelling, swelling. And I, my parents brought me home because I, I don't know exactly why, but I'm assuming the cost of medical care, they didn't have insurance. And a lot of that would mean asking for help. So I laid in my bed <laughs> at home for several days and I developed staph infection in my leg and I was on the brink of death. 
And so really that whole experience has become that defining moment about you have to ask for help. You can't get through it alone. And when we don't ask for help, then we feel isolated and alone. I think that's been really a challenge about the pandemic altogether. So for me in particular, yes, that idea of asking for help has been really, 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 really hard for me, but I'm mm. learning to do it. Yes, it's interesting, isn't it? I you know, personally find that challenging as well and that need to ask for help. I wonder if that's bred into us. It, as you said, it was bred into you as a child. I think it's bred into a lot of us as women. And I, sometimes I ponder as to whether it's part of the DNA of a woman or not. I suspect it's not, but it sometimes feels like it, doesn't it? Because it, it is courageous. And we talk about so many things in our lives, both men and women needing courage, but that courage to ask for help and then help comes. It is interesting how quickly help is given in every respect, whether it's through illness or through the need of other women. And I know we'll talk about that in a moment with your not-for-profit experience. So I'd like to segue on to the reason you chose the particular study path you took. So you, you're now a fully qualified accountant and working in that space and working in the finance industry, particularly with women. How did you choose that? And what motivates you to do that work that you now do? So after working 19 years of physical labor, I knew I wanted a different life. And I knew education was the key to that opportunity. And I was fortunate to be able to attend college. I chose to study accounting because it's the language of business. And at a very early age, I saw the connection between success and financial literacy. So my career acts me, uh, it allows me to act as a interpreter of the language of business and as a teacher of the language of business. I'm really grateful for this career choice because I've been able to see firsthand the difference financial fluency makes in the lives of women, helping them start businesses, gain scholarships, go to school. So, you know, it's, it's been the challenge, this idea of why am I motivated to help women as well? Because in my home, the girls worked aside the boys all day and just a traditional patriarchal culture. Then we rushed in to make the boys dinner, clean up after them, care for my baby siblings. And there was some internal element that said, I want to rebel against this, but I didn't know how to do that at home. So I tested that in the community. I experimented with gender roles in a way that no one had in these conservative communities. At nine, I was the first girl to go out for the wrestling team. And, the, and then at 13, I was the first girl to go out for the football team. I didn't appreciate being treated second tier because of my gender. So I just wanted equal respect, equal access to opportunities, no matter who I was. You know, fortunately, eventually I learned to just throw out the rules and be my own version of, of a woman, even if that means football cleats one minute and high heels the next. I'm a strong woman and I decide for myself which role to accept. I'm an advocate and a mother. And so my work and my passion is just about helping remove these financial barriers so other women have equal access, equal respect, equal resources, and the option to decide who they want to be. Mm. Yes, it's um, <clears throat> often very difficult uh, to overcome some of that gender, gender stereotyping. So it was interesting, and that's quite some time ago now that you were experimenting in that space. Whereas now we see women playing football as part of clubs, et cetera, and we see women's soccer being top of the world. So it's quite interesting how much it's, it's changed in that probably 20 years or so since you were doing that or longer. What do you think is your current passion? You know, if we just talk about the passion and what influences you to juggle the act with your family and work with the, the women you work with and continue to study, what passion pushes you to do that, do you think? right now? I really think we see this theme in my life of this idea of asking for help and giving that help to other people <laughs> and this idea that I am where I am because of the people who have helped me move forward. So my passion really is about helping women be treated with the same respect all humans should be. And it comes from my, this, this background, all my experiences and it influences the work that I do. For example, when I was 14 years old, a senior logger, quite a few years older than me, maybe 40 years older, he came into my room and he attempted to rape me. I escaped. I grabbed the phone. I called the first person that came to my mind, and it was actually my math teacher. 
And she came in with just a couple minutes to pick me up. I got in her car and I peered behind me. I saw my perpetrator there and I thought, what would have happened if she hadn't been willing to get out of bed in the middle of the night and come pick me up? No questions asked. Because of individuals like her who lifted me, encouraged me, supported me every step of the way, I've been able to overcome trauma. Even when I was told that that was my fault and I had led him on and that was all my fault because I'm the woman. And I've just been able to overcome that trauma the best that I can. And I've been able to pursue wonderful opportunities. And so this experience combined with many others like it, it makes me passionate about ensuring that every woman has an advocate like this. Someone who can pull them up and out and provide what, what you've called in earlier conversations, this wraparound support. So nobody falls through the cracks. Mm. <clears throat> wraparound support is so important for, for children, for adults, for men, for women. It's when do we need that wraparound support? And there's so many times in our life we need, uh, you could call it a blanket, whatever you like. I know in the education space, that's what we call it. It's wraparound. It's not just one intervention. It's, it's all of the interventions that support a young person to achieve their educational outcomes and it's the same in life and same for women because we're offering those opportunities aren't we for women to grow and develop you've spoken a little earlier about um we have spoken at times about people that have helped you so if i take that into the word mentor perhaps and there's a lot of research around the power of mentoring and you often have used with me the word encourages, the encourages along your journey and being told that you matter and are capable of anything. What value do, do you think those mentors or encouragers or helpers have brought to you in your development as a woman, a professional and a leader? So my encouragers have a really special gift. I see this in my scholarships and the awards and all my mentors. They see beyond my circumstances and they expand my vision until I can too. Some people argue that hard work and perseverance are all it takes to be successful in life. I know hundreds of books that make us feel guilty about this, but I know a lot of people who work really hard and persevere and they never quite reach their personal professional development goals. I really believe the reason I am here today is because of these encouragers who expanded my vision until I just no longer define myself by my circumstances. I remember also like as a teenager thinking that the only way up was by putting people down. I remember putting down some of my female schoolmates because I learned, I had learned that. And I was just in competition in my home. I was desperately competing for my parents' elusive approval or to be the best. And of course you get that in a family my size. But my mentors have completely corrected this misunderstanding. And they taught me that as women, we're just so much stronger when we stand together. They stress the importance of women helping one another. They emphasize abundance. They say there's more than enough room for all of us to succeed. And that when one of us succeed, all of us do. And when one of us fail, all of us do. And they work as hard as I do to see me succeed. And with this understanding, I work as hard as I can to see my mentees succeed. And this pay it forward continuum is really this, this experience, what these encouragers bring, bring forward. Mm. That's, that's fabulous to have those people in your life to, to help you go forward. Just as I move into the next question, I'll just say to our audience that if you have questions of Tressa, please add them to the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, and I'll pick them up towards the end of the session and put them to Tressa. Tressa, you're definitely a trailblazer for women and you demonstrate how courage and resilience can result in, in excellent success. You're the founder of Undaunted Women, a not-for-profit helping women to become courageous and steadfast. Can you share a little bit about the pathway of the idea, the formation of that idea, <clears throat> to the formation of your organisation and the work that you're doing? Apologies, uh, early in the morning down here in Australia, so... <clears throat> just a little bit of voice problem. So share that pathway because I'm really interested in our, our viewers today will be as well, the idea to the formation and what work you're actually doing in that not-for-profit. So my purpose in creating the nonprofit is just to offer the hope to others that all of these individuals we've spoken of have offered to me. It's, it started 100% self-funded. It's currently run 100% by volunteers. We don't get government grants or anything. 
So really the, it, the idea consolidated for me when I was standing on a breakwater on going to the Rockland breakwater lighthouse. I had never seen a breakwater before, but it was a granite path that went all the way to the sea floor. And I was just astounded on one side, these waves were hitting really hard against these rocks. And on the other side, it was this safe Harbor. It's a word we hear a lot in accounting and taxes, especially, but these boats were resting serenely. They weren't moved. The currents were the same. Everything was the same, but they weren't moved. And I thought, what is the word for this? How can I be like these boats in the safe Harbor? that are not defined by my circumstances and how can I help other women become that way as well? So my vision was to help women become courageously resolute despite the circumstances and to help all women find that safe harbor. So I've been able to find that through mentors and friends and advocates. And so I've turned this into the idea for the nonprofit and it really, the nonprofit then the vision into action became with one question. I had a colleague that sent out surveys of people to help at the beginning of COVID. And the question she asked was, she was giving out food and she was smart enough to ask, do you own a can opener? Well, in the beginning of the pandemic, 78% of people on the move in the greater Seattle area said they didn't own a can opener. Can you imagine it? We're giving out food. They have the can of food, but they have no way of accessing what's inside. So women really need this symbolic can opener of friendship and emotional support to overcome the individual barriers and access the power of self-reliance. Undaunted Women offers this holistic interdisciplinary approach to assisting women reach their self-reliance and cultural integration goals. It takes this personal one-on-one approach to advocacy like I've had to have. For example, during a visit with one woman, she described how she was being exploited for labor months after fleeing her war-torn country to the United States. Before relocating, she was a tailor And so she asked for help finding a machine to start a tailoring business. My local Zonta chapter responded to my request for a sewing machine. I pulled on my accounting background. We sat with her, helped her understand how to use her more advanced machine, helped her generate additional paying customers, all while holding her hand to help her understand the language and the nuisances of culture and business. Her success, though, even more than growing a business and getting legal working conditions, is knowing she's valued and she's worthy. And her success is also her success. These women that I serve in this nonprofit, some are, well, many who are child brides are now in the US and they're reaching out for help. I see them taking steps to learn to drive, to learn English, to fiercely enter a profession, to start a business. They inspire me and I'm compelled to meet them where they are and show them how to rise. Like my experience in my youth, it wouldn't have been possible to get where I am today without mentors meeting me exactly where I was, accepting me and showing me the way out. My work with Undaunted Women is allowing me to make my work, my vision, my life come full circle to advocate and reach women who have been forgotten or otherwise marginalized or have figuratively get shattered legs and they won't make it without this one-on-one outreach. Where do you get your support for your not-for-profit? You know, these things don't run without some support, both financially and materially. So, and I know it's a fairly new organization, isn't it, uh, Tressa? So... Um, how's that come about? I know lots of people who listen to this webinar or watch this webinar uh, are connected to not-for-profits or would be interested in um, maybe setting up their own with a group of colleagues. So so where do you get your support from in terms of the actual organization? So this is where that asking for help piece comes into play, being vulnerable and doing it, because obviously I can't do it alone and I haven't done it alone. So it takes, it takes a village. So for me, I've just reached out to my friends, my mentors. I reached out to my Zonta club and they had me start Undaunted Women. It it started under their fiscal sponsorship Mm -hmm. and they made me one of their service projects. A lot of the funding has come from just individuals who are giving just whatever they possibly can to support. I know in the beginning of COVID, a lot of this, we had about 40 families we were trying to get food for. They couldn't go to the grocery store and get it. There was no place to find what they needed. And so I just reached out to my neighbors, my friends, and then they reached out and they reached out. And before I knew it, we had gotten plenty of supplies from everybody opening up their pantries and giving what they could. And so it's just this idea of abundance. It's out there. 
it's available. Anyone who's thinking about starting this a nonprofit or doing work like this, it's really possible once you just start. You just have the courage to start and to ask for help. Mm, that's fabulous. Thank you. So you've, you are becoming or perhaps have become a very visible role model through your awards because, you know, there's lots of articles about you on, on the internet when one looks. Um, you've started Undaunted Women, you have clients, etc. How do you embrace that? role another role that you play of being a role model for others this has been a challenge for me I grew up very much thinking I just had to be perfect especially to be a good role model I had to be without flaw but there was a point in my life after the birth of my first daughter when I was surrounded completely by darkness it was it's unsurprising given about the child trauma I faced but I suffered severely with these postpartum issues after the birth of my daughter. I found debilitating depression, anxiety, and even psychosis. Given the stigma on mental health, I didn't feel like I could talk to anyone about my struggles. And I was worried about what might happen if I was honest about what was going on in my head. So I turned to the library for stories and I desperately needed to find someone. Has anyone experienced what I have? I didn't find many books. It was really sad how many were available at the time, but I found one story. It was called Down Came the Rain by Brooke Shields. And it was about her journey through her postpartum issues. And her words really helped me see that I wasn't alone. And it gave me the courage to speak up because there's nothing noble and it doesn't help anyone to be silent. She became a wonderful example to me. And I learned really quickly, the best role models are simply individuals who walk through hard things and they come out on the other side. The best role models are people who help people feel connected rather than isolated by being honest and vulnerable about their challenges. And with this understanding, I am trying to be vulnerable and share my story with others and be vulnerable and ask for help with my nonprofit and the things that I do. It's not easy, but this is how I embrace my role. Mm, thank you. That's, and, and it'll grow, grow on you. I think you'll grow with it and it'll grow on you as you become more of a role model in more places uh, as your life progresses, I'm sure. This series is about remarkable women and powerful stories. So what, what do you think are the two or three top characteristics of remarkable leaders? I think as we've looked at, so leaders aren't perfect and they don't have perfect lives. I think remarkable leaders are simply people who tap into others' innate desire to help one another, and they inspire confidence and change in times of uncertainty. That's especially come to the forefront with this pandemic. Everyone's looking and saying, please, somebody inspire confidence right now because there's a lot of uncertainty. And last but not least, I think leaders that are remarkable are just really compassionate with themselves. They're compassionate with others. And so they're able to stretch their comfort zone and able to manage, manifest, and create the future that they predict that they're inspiring confidence with. I, I'm working to achieve these leadership characteristics by embracing uncertainty through self-compassion, through expanding my comfort zone, through asking for help with undaunted women and meeting people that I wouldn't normally meet, and through vulnerably sharing my story so I can become this kind of leader or an expert of embracing uncertainty. Mm -hmm. Fabulous. It's important uh, for all of us, and so many women I know and work with in my, my work are interested in how they can develop self-confidence and self-belief and claim their space and followed on by keeping and holding on to that confidence and resilience when things aren't going so well or when times, you know, when, when the individual is low. So do you have any ideas for us about how to develop that and then retain it? And I then will move on to, so who, do you, who or where do you go when things are low for you, when you're in a struggle? So when I was 16, I went out for our community's Junior Miss program. It's a local program for girls in their last year of high school, and they compete with talent and interview and poison appearance and academics. Unsurprisingly, I faced many obstacles as I tried to turn from you know, wrestler, football player, blogger to pageant princess. My biggest obstacle was that I had no confidence. On the night of the program, I was lined up on the stage next to beautiful classmates 
I had dirt under my fingernails from working in the woods. Everyone could see that I was wearing cleats instead of high heels like the other contestants. Everyone saw my deformed leg, the long scar running all the way from my knee to my ankle. And aside from these outward things, I was desperately insecure and felt deep shame and responsibility for the physical, sexual, and emotional abuse that I'd faced. I'm not sure how I got up on stage, and I'm not sure why, but I think part of me thought that if the judges said I was the winner, I was the best, I could get my confidence back. If the judges said that, it would erase all the negative voices in my head, and I could move forward. But it didn't. And I thought back on that experience and I've wondered if there's a better way to pursue self-confidence than symbolically lining ourselves up against other people on a stage. I really wonder if lasting self-confidence was ever born from getting approval from someone else or being successful in what we decide measures our worth. This experience and many like it have just reminded me that me doing my best is good enough. Hmm. It's good enough. And it's reason enough to believe in myself. And the only way that I can remember that is to stop and have compassion for myself and recognize those moments of suffering. When I do that, when I stop and say, this is a moment of suffering, I remember, oh, everybody suffers sometimes. And instead of feeling isolated by comparison, I see I'm part of a big human family and all who, every one of us has worth that's intrinsic. And just taking that moment to be compassionate with myself instead of passing judgment and helping me see myself more clearly, I'm able to see other people more clearly. And as I see us all humans having human experiences and that we're all in this together, we all have worth and compassion and and we're worthy of compassion no matter what, they mirror that back to me as well. I'm still learning how to encompass self-compassion. When I first heard it, I thought it was a bad word, but this is what my experience has taught me so far about the best way to pursue self-esteem. It's, yes, it's a, a, a different twist on it from what I might hear from others, but it's a really interesting, it's that self-compassion. How do we um, treat ourselves kindly and, and look after ourselves first? And there's a lot of analogies around, aren't there? Like we need to put our own mask on first before helping others, etc. There's many around that we can go for. I know you discovered Zonta through the Jane M. Klausman Women in Business Scholarship and you're an international winner in 2020. And I now know you joined the Zonta Club of South Puget Sound uh, after that. Your work aligns a lot with the mission of Zonta. You've you've cursed through the notion of child marriage, um, the worth of education, et cetera, all the things you're doing really aligns. How is this award supporting you currently in your work, in your studies? So this award has done what I've spoken, all the mentorships have done, just shown me that there was something in me. It was something that I'd never seen in myself. They were pointing out my story was unique. And I thought, didn't everyone grow up with 13 siblings logging on top of a mountain? And they just really took me to a different place. And the acts of the words and awards, they spoke above me and said, you have a work to do. And they pushed me to do it. And as I mentioned before, they've supported me. They've given me a family. I have many mentors. Some are members of the Zonta South Puget Sound chapter and some are members of other Zonta clubs. I'm just trying to learn everything I can from them to be a better leader. They teach me how to be more effective advocate. When I run into problems with individuals that I advocate for that I don't know how to solve, they're the first ones I call. They've made me one of their service projects and just check in regularly with me. This scholarship has just given me a family. It's allowed me to connect with with the whole Zonta family and the education that's resulted has had a ripple effect. I hope that you can see the ripple effect that's had on the lives of other women that I'm able to help and improve that. And that's really the difference that Zonta International and that award has has made in my life. And and it can and continues to support your further study as you as you choose to go ahead with study. So Zonta International envisions a world in which women's rights are recognised as human rights and every woman is able to achieve her full potential. How do you see things changing for women in the next decade and particularly for women in difficult and disadvantaged circumstances? In 2019, I met with six young women from India, Jordan, Israel, Egypt. One of the young women spoke up in a conference we were in and she asked a question that really struck me. 
she asked this senior leader of a large organization. She said, how do I get people to take me seriously? I'm an accountant, yet every time I walk into the room, people say, go get me some coffee. This speaker, like I said, she was a prestigious leader of a large company and she looked over her shoulder at her male superior and turned back and said, I've never experienced anything like that. <laughs> When the meeting adjourned, I immediately, I hope it's true. I hope she had it. But when it adjourned, I ran to the table of the young woman and who asked the question. And I said, I, you are not alone. And I, I shared my story with her too often after matching the advocate with women in a particular difficult circumstances, I hear, I didn't know these kind of things happen here. I thought these kind of things only happen overseas. So I really think that as we speak up and help one another, listen to each other and share our stories, it will bring attention to the reality of the issues we're facing and that they're everywhere. I believe that with this increased awareness, more and more people will join our cause to ensure that women's rights are recognized as human rights and so that every woman's able to achieve her full potential. Hmm, thanks. And it, of course, it's a big um, big audacious goal, isn't it? And uh, I talk about the same thing, the whole gender equality and human rights. I say to people that I'm working on my legacy being I do everything I can every day to support at least someone, a woman, to be in a better place or to work with men to support women to be in a better place so we get to that gender equality because without women being 50% of the decision-making tables around the globe, the world is missing out, isn't it? So uh, I hear where you're coming from. So we're moving slowly, but to a close of the conversation. I know you have a book that's very close to publication and we've talked about it and you've, you've given me a sneak peek of what it might be about. Our audience will really enjoy hearing more about this. In my Anything book- that I you're willing to share right now. Yeah, so in my book, I just go into more detail about this shattered leg and getting the help that I needed and how that came about. I talk about that an issue of like, when can I get the help I need lying in bed? My grandma drove 900 miles to get me life flighted to a hospital just in time to save me. And I just examine our family's choice to continue logging alongside, you know, family rivalries and the difficulty of coming out of denial and realizing, realizing what my upbringing, you know, that there's some untangling to do. I talk about the sexual abuse that I faced and overcoming the lack of support, blame, and shame I faced. And like Brooke Shields' book, I also share my five-year battle to overcome the thick darkness and despair that came from anxiety and depression. And that's just a few things. I hope my audience of former child lumberjacks is really small. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, a lot of women have some really challenging circumstances. So I hope there's pieces that everyone can relate to. And the best part is, even though my story started out a bit unfair, you can see through the work that I do now, my story has blossomed like a rose in the desert and I'm helping a lot of people. It comes, sharing comes at great personal sacrifices, but I really hope that others can find the power within themselves to share their story. And it really speaks to the value I see in sharing it. When might it be published? Do you have a possible public publication date? So I am in the conversation with different publishers now, and it's in the final editing process, but I do have a way you can check for updates on that. Okay. So I know you can be found quite easily on the internet <clears throat> through Teresa Lacey or Undaunted Women. So if people today are interested, they can find you there quite easily. So what's next for you, Teresa? What are your goals, ambitions for the next three to five years? My first goal is to get a full night's sleep. Remember, I have children waking me up every hour through the night. So that's just to start, though. <laughs> Weeks before school shut down during, due to COVID, my daughter, who experiences autism and seizures, she was taken to her developmental preschool on a minibus. When she arrived at school, no one got her off the bus, and she was forgotten, left all alone, and scared on the bus all afternoon. Mm -hmm. So my second goal is to be a strong advocate for my children to ensure they have access to every educational opportunity available and never feel forgotten like that again. And mm -hmm. then with the work in my nonprofit is to help other women also never feel forgotten like that, to everyone be matched with an advocate and someone who reminds them of that, they're not forgotten. And lastly, of course, I'm terrified to share my full story and my lessons about it in my memoir. 
but I look forward to the conversations it brings. And I guess, you know, a PhD isn't totally out of the question, just of, I really enjoy using the knowledge I've obtained to help people. And I really enjoy teaching and guiding my students. So what's your greatest gift that's taking you into that next phase of your life? So one thing for me is that I fearlessly take on challenges. I'm courageous enough to make mistakes. But my biggest support in that is that I have a lot of people helping me when I get in a little over my head. Mm. That's fabulous. Okay, so now we'll move to the um, Q&A. And I have quite a few questions coming in. I've just been doing a sneak peek as you've been talking um, to me, Tressa. So there's a few questions here. Let's go with the first one. It's from Mita and it says, at the time, were there not child labour laws in the United States? If you go back to your childhood, were there not child labour laws? There are definitely child labour laws. Um, it was thought to be legislated in the 1940s. Mm. However, even when a newspaper article of my family sitting on the stack of boards at our family sawmill came to the front page news, nobody really took notice. Just because of these communities that I grew up in, it wasn't an odd, odd thing. Like I said, I really thought everyone grew up the way I did. I didn't know that my story was unique. Mm. David's asked, how would you advise women to choose mentors and find good help? Sometimes those opportunities aren't available. A lot of the women I work with in the nonprofit won't have the opportunity to meet, to meet mentors like that. Um, I think as we've talked about before, many of them have faced child marriage. Uh, 70, 80% have faced forced marriage and almost 60% were married before 16. And the literacy rate is about 15%. So they don't have a lot of opportunities and a lot of choices. And that's why I'm trying to get in and offer advocates there. But if you have the opportunity to find an advocate, the best advice that I could give that I heard from two, two people from Microsoft, they said, you don't choose mentors and advocates based on their success in life. You choose them based on what their whole entire life looks like, who they are as a person. What are their interpersonal relationships? They talked about the mistakes they made in seeking mentors that just made a lot of money, but not realizing that these people might be on their 10th marriage or might be working 180 hours. They're just never stopping working. So it's just really looking at that whole person and saying, do they live their life? Are they balanced? Are they temperate in all of these areas, in the areas that are important to you? Kim has asked, at what age or grade level do you think education should implement financial literacy and responsibility mathematics classes? Do you think traditional maths classes in high school should be replaced with financial management classes? Um, I was a maths teacher originally when I started out as a teacher in the education space. So Kim's question resonates with me absolutely. But as someone who has chosen the accounting and financial career, what's your view on that? I think a greater financial literacy at a younger age would be helpful. I didn't take any accounting classes until I was in college and only because I chose that as my career path. Otherwise, I would not have been exposed to this language of business or accounting. Hmm. It's, it's a challenge, isn't it? Because schools are often asked to do so many things and they have core curriculum they need to teach and schools have a particular purpose. And so often they're there's push and pull in schools around which pieces of education they should pick up and how should that be done and what. And then it can crowd the curriculum. Here's an educator speaking, but it can crowd that curriculum, can't it? And you've got children in the schooling system, so I think you understand. So it's a, it's a real challenge as to how that financial literacy is covered, but it's so important for all and particularly for women these days, I think. Yeah. Um, this is from another of our attendees today. What's your vision for Undaunted Women within the next five to 10 years? Where, where do you think you'd like to take it? So I, obviously we talked about just making sure every single woman is matched with an advocate. As far as our strategic goals are, we're just hoping to create partnerships that are sustainable and useful to the community and Undaunted Women and to become a community leader in personalized pr approaches to advocacy, to maintain a first-class board, staff, and volunteers, 
to grow our contribution and to increase access to advocates. We really believe in helping individuals identify and remove barriers in a way that's best for them as they pursue what's possible, reiterating the understanding that potential is not defined by their present circumstances. Mm. Excellent. I'm, I'm just doing a double check. I'm reading some of the chat comments and I'm reading some of the q and I'll come and share some of the chat comments in a moment. Bernadette, uh, someone has asked when your book will be available. And um, as you said, you don't have a release date yet, but it's in the final stages of editing. So I guess it'll be released sometime in the next few months, all being well, maybe. Would that be a fair comment? So you can check for updates at tressalacy.com. You can sign up to get updates on that. Okay, thanks, Tressa. That'll, that'll answer the question from our attendee today. Bernadette has said, has said um, you're an amazing woman. As a Zonchin, I'm in, extremely proud of you and your thoughts. Were there moments in your journey that you experienced regrets and how did you overcome these or those moments? So about regrets. I have lots of regrets. The one thing I've learned is that regrets like to hide in the shadows. They, they grow when you're quiet about them. So I'm coming through this by being honest about my regrets and open about those. And also as a message we keep hearing is compassion and just saying, you made a mistake, but it's not the end of the world. We all make mistakes and have this little conversation with myself that goes something like that. I know you didn't mean to do that. I know you don't like to hurt people or you don't like to make mistakes, but everyone does that sometimes. It's okay. You're going to get through this. And why don't you just try? We'll do a little bit better tomorrow or we'll try not to do that. You know, we'll work. We'll just get a little better tomorrow. Uh, Teresa has asked, was being an award winner in 2020, um, did that help you to want to join the Zonta Club? My first meeting with the Zonta Club, it really felt like a family. They go around and they talk about each of their, they each talk about something good or something bad that's happened in the last month. And that immediately just drew me because I felt like we're really a family. I wonder sometimes with the Zonta family, if it's a hundred percent about what we're doing for others or what we're doing for ourselves. So um, I'll just move on. Do you have a title for your, your book yet? Or is that a work in progress and you're not ready to reveal? So right now I have Lumberjack Girl, but as you know, working with publishers, sometimes they, they have opinions of their own, so. Watch this space. That's a watch this space, isn't it? Um, so there's, um, there's um, some comments in the chat and all sorts of things about um, that whole self-compassion compassion, sorry, and not beating ourselves up about our shortcomings. So that strong message has resonated with many of our guests this morning is uh, learning not to be hard on ourselves. And I call it learning not to wake up at three in the morning, being worried about something that I did or didn't do yesterday. And I'm, I'm sure you don't do that because you're woken up anyway. <laughs> and, and I just need to go back to that comment about a full night's sleep. I know the other morning when we were talking with yourself and, and um, Megan and um, Kate and Diana at, at, at Zonda headquarters, uh, I think you'd all decided that was the one thing you really wanted was a full night's sleep. So we'll, we'll, you'll get it one day, but I think you're a long way off. <laughs> um, anyway, it's fabulous. And people are thanking you for your time today. And Megan has, has put out on the chat line your website. She's just put your website out so people can see it in, in the chat. I guess I'm most interested as I start to move to close our, our time together today, Teresa. I have one question and I'm really interested in how you would describe yourself as a leader. So when you, you look at yourself, Teresa, Tressa the leader, because this is a series about leadership as well. So, so who is Tressa the leader? What would be your elevator pitch, you know, your 12 seconds of describing yourself as a leader at the moment in your life? My hope is to be that word undaunted, courageously resolute despite adversity and not defined by my circumstances. I really, my goal is to inspire confidence, especially in uncertainty, and to just say it's about hope. We can all be leaders. I'm not perfect. 
few people that, that I know are. And it's just about being courageous enough to try and take that first step and try to tap into that desire everyone has to help one another anyway. And there's one more question that's just popped in uh, from Karen. What impact has COVID had on your project, on your Undaunted Women? COVID has been really helpful in this respect because it identified the gap very quickly. So when I said, who needs the help the most? Who are the most vulnerable women right now? They were quickly identified. Mm. And a lot of um, people are wrapping up their, their chat at the moment, which you may not have seen, but they're appreciating your focus on helping others and understanding that grit and hard work doesn't always overcome systemic inequality. And that's where organisations like your Undaunted Women, Zonta International, and so many of the many, many not-for-profits across our world are picking that up and taking it to a higher level to try and address that systemic inequality. So a lot of um, comments about how inspiring and empowering your conversation has been today. So the last word from you, Tressa, what's a thought you want to leave everyone with as I close the conversation? It's just about hope. You're not alone. I care, others care about learning to empower ourselves through compassion, even though it sounds like it's a bad thing when, when put on ourselves, it's, it's not. It's about working hard, but remembering to ask for help, seeing that anybody can be a leader and mostly about recognizing those encouraged on your journey and reaching out with tenacity for them and accepting their help. And thank you so much, Santa, for your help. I hope you can really clearly see the domino effect of supporting me. Oh, there's a big domino effect out there. So, Tressa, it's been a privilege for me to meet you and to get to know you as a result of uh, coming to this conversation today. And I know we'll stay in touch as time progresses. And thank you for sharing your story today. And we're very happy to have you as part of the Zonta family. You're truly a remarkable woman. On behalf of Zonta International, I wish to underscore the importance of the Zonta Foundation for Women. Your donation to this foundation will be welcomed and you can choose to support a range of programs such as Jane M. Klausman Scholarship with your individual donation or through the Zonta Club. The work of Zonta International relies on donations to ensure the path of empowering women and girls and achieving gender equality is made a little easier. This series is scheduled every month and I will be very excited to see you at the next session planned for 28th of April, US Central Time. Our next guest is Bandana Rana from Nepal. Bandana has three decades of experience in promoting women's rights and gender equality at the grassroots, national, regional and global level and her story is a compelling one. We wish to take this series into a broad global arena and touch as many lives as possible. Spread the word to all your friends and colleagues and watch out for the promotion of this next webinar. We have many remarkable women already lined up for coming months. So again, thank you, Tressa. Thank you to, my to the team in Chicago for doing a fabulous job as always in getting this webinar to go live. And I look forward to seeing you all again in April and thank you to our audience for being present today. Thank you. It's my pleasure.